Today, AMD unveiled the RX 6700 XT, and personally, I wasn't expecting to be surprised by anything in this morning's presentation. I already exclusively leaked the exact price of the 6700 XT on Sunday, which uh, it was cool to see some people like Linus acknowledge that, though. That's always nice. Um, but besides that, I've been expecting some sort of AMD graphics card to launch that would have 12 gigabytes of RAM and fall between the performance of a full GA106, you know, that's what the 3060 uses, and some cut down GA104 card level of performance. I expected AMD for months now to launch some 12 gigabyte card with 40 compute units clocked blazing fast. So... Forget about price, forget about the performance. I wasn't expecting to be surprised by anything in those departments. The one thing I was hoping might surprise me is AMD starting to talk about something, anything that is regarding a competitor to NVIDIA's DLSS. Now, calm down people on Team Red. I can already hear some people yelling at me that that's not really a fully baked feature yet, and I actually mostly agree. I still consider DLSS something that's half-baked, but, but honestly not quite a gimmick. I have to say that playing Minecraft with RTX turned on and DLSS on my 2060 laptop, it worked. Arguably better than playing without DLSS on my 6800 XT I just reviewed. So... Well, DLSS may not be a fully fleshed out feature in every game yet, it's not a gimmick and it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem, in my opinion, for AMD, the longer they go without talking about this because the fact that they haven't even mentioned it yet makes you go, well, so what's going to happen late this year when DLSS is in most games? Will you have anything ready? I think they might, but they don't right now. And... It is a problem for a mid-range graphics card. Let's be honest. The 6800 XT I reviewed running at 2.75 gigahertz maxed out everything in 4K 120 that I played. It didn't even really need DLSS. But this is a mid-range graphics card, despite the price, I suppose. It's 192, but this is something meant to sell in volume. It's not as powerful. It really could use that extra feature. And I'm just starting this video by saying I'm let down that it wasn't shown off. So let's talk about the literal reveal for a second. My immediate impression in the first five minutes of this 6700 XT presentation was a lot of these types of things. A premium cooler with premium components. How great Radeon software is. How many features it has. That big esports teams are paying up for Radeon. Maxed out settings. Big words. Premium, maxed out, professional. AMD was trying to come off as much of a premium brand as they could right from the start of this reveal, and they were doing so in an attempt to butter you guys up before revealing the price, which if you see that turning there, that's AMD steering past the price in a car as at high a speed as possible. I've never seen a price get flashed on screen so quickly. And honestly, it's a bit concerning that it shows suggested e-tailer price, you know, so a little vague and price subject to change. But for now, I'm not going to read into that too much. I, I assume AMD is just covering their ass by showing that versus before just showing a flat out price. When I saw that price and I saw no reveal of a DLSS competitor, I was like, Ugh, I don't think this is going to go great, you know. But then they showed the performance. And when it comes to the performance... It actually seems stronger than what I expected. I have to admit it. At this point, I have to at least admit that the performance numbers coming out in that second 6700 XT leak I did were probably talking about a cut down die meant for the 6700, not the 6700 XT. And I guess you might say, well, whatever, your most recent 6700 XT leak, you know, about a month ago stated that this thing would probably beat the 3060 Ti, and this does. But yeah, I never said it would beat the 3070. This is definitely performing higher than I expected. Wow. 
what's going on. It only has 40 compute units. If you do the math, if it were, if it does on review day, narrowly beat the 3070, this thing's within about 20% of a 6,800. We're having far less compute units and less infinity cache and only a 192 bit bus. What the heck is going on? Well, the first thing I'm going to say is that AMD's slides showing performance were more vague this time than they were before. So I have to just say that my alarm bells go off a little bit. I am concerned AMD's taking a bit more of a page out of NVIDIA's book and cherry picking what they show you in an attempt to get you to swallow a higher price point. I don't like seeing that. But additionally, there might be some other performance things going on in the Navi 22 architecture versus the Navi 21. And something going on with the clock speeds that I think is surprising a lot of people from what I'm hearing in backroom chatter. I want to talk about that, but first, I do have to go through a quick ad from a sponsor. Skillshare is a sponsor of this video. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people that allows its members to explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. It's curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads, and they're always launching new premium classes so you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. I myself hope to grow this year by getting back into writing, and short stories are a great place to start. So I might take the class by Yayun Lee, who can help you craft smaller narratives before you move on to trying to write bigger ones. Do not hesitate to use Skillshare because it is very affordable. It's less than $10 a month for an annual subscription, and the first 1,000 people to use the link on screen and in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium membership sign up for skillshare today a wonderful resource for learning all right you are good you get your treat now <laughs> all right back to the conversation so let's just assume that it's not all cherry picking here going on with that performance we saw trading blows with a 3070 and firmly trading blows which is not what i expected well, again, I have to emphasize, I do suspect there's some cherry picking going on this time around, but it really is worth emphasizing that the benchmarks they showed were all in 1440p, and they made sure to not mention 4K at all with this graphics card. Most of the time, the numbers I see behind the scenes on graphics cards is regards to 4K gaming performance. No one tests in 1080p with these things anymore when they're do when they're sending me information. It's it's always 4K. So, the fact that they didn't show 4K makes me suspect that the numbers I suggested of being between a 3060 Ti and 3070, that's probably the 4k performance there i i am suspicious that at least the lower bend models of the 6700 xt will not beat the 3070 in 4k at least not in games that need less than eight gigabytes of vram which a decent amount need more than that in 4k now plenty i play but that's a whole other discussion the other thing to talk about here is that Based on my math, 100 megabytes or a little over that is what you would want to sufficiently accelerate 4K frame rates, right? So 96 megabytes is cutting it pretty close. And I actually think that 128 was cutting it a little close too. We already saw that Big Navi performed relative to Ampere better in 1440p than in 4K. So I expect that to be doubly true this time around. But when it does have enough infinity cache, when the frame buffer isn't overwhelmed, I think it's worth pointing something else out. There is far more infinity cache per CU with Little Navi than there is with Big Navi. So I really think it's worth emphasizing that we could be seeing a situation where performance not only falls off more of a cliff, relative to big Navi and 4K versus 1440p, but that in effect, it gets a bigger boost in 1440p than big Navi does from the infinity cache because it has more cash per compute unit and it's clocked so quickly. That is what I would like to suggest could be going on here, that it truly is a mega 1440p gaming card, but 4K really is just for big Navi. So in effect here, it's almost like we're seeing a more exaggerated situation of what's going to happen. The 3070 versus the 6700 XT compared to the 6800 XT versus the 3080. 
in 4K, Ampere wins. But this time around, it may gain more performance on Navi than before with the bigger dies. And in 1440p, AMD may have an even bigger advantage relative to Ampere than their bigger brethren had before, if that makes sense. I don't think I mixed up how I said that. And another thing worth bringing up in terms of being surprised by the performance of the 6700 XT is that, well, remember, I've been talking about AIB's planning to put big, beefy coolers on incredibly highly clocked, better binned 6700 XT dies for months now. You know, that hasn't changed. And I think people may want to consider a situation where up until a few weeks ago, AMD was planning to have the reference model clocked decently lower than those higher bin dies in AIB cards. But what if they just decided not to have it clocked lower, right? If, think about it this way, right? Even though you might have some dies perform better than others, clock far faster, that doesn't mean you still can't overclock the lower bin dies. I think we may need to consider that AMD may have both the reference model and the higher bin die models clocked well above 200 watts because why not? People don't care about efficiency right now. They're buying $400 Ampere cards. People care about getting the most performance they can in a new graphics card that they can actually buy. So what's the point in clocking some reference model lower, even if the higher clocked models will who knows, clock 200, 300 megahertz above what AMD can put in theirs, they still might as well push the reference model as hard as possible. Give it an 8-pin and a 6-pin. Why not? People need products, any products, just push them as hard as you can. And that's, that's the focus of a video I talked about a bit ago about if AMD should launch the 6700 XT, that they really should, and they should push it as hard as possible because they can make two 6700 XT dies for every 6800 die. So if it's most of the performance with half the die size, fill the god dang channel with something because people are desperate for new graphics cards right now. And I just want to be clear, that last point I made about having two dies with both of them being overclocked, none of them being tamed down now, is half speculation from me. I do know there's two different dies, but that it's half speculation, but it's something I think people may want to consider. Because the back chatter I'm hearing is that a lot of people are surprised, and I think that explanation makes sense. That, well, there could be two dies, one bin higher, they're just still both going to be overclocked. Which, if this is true, and again, speculation at, at this point here. If that's true, though, my god, some of those AIB cards may clock to 2.8 gigahertz or something wild. I may have been wrong to doubt that it'll clock much higher than Navi 21. But I don't know. We'll just have to see. My overall point, though, with everything I've been saying to explain what's going on with its performance is that maybe we should just have a bit of skepticism because it feels to me like we don't know everything right now and that I think we're going to learn a lot more over the next few days. Heck, by the time Broken Silicon 90 comes out, less than a day after this video releases, by the way, so look out for that, there may already be updates being communicated. So just take a little bit of the last part of what I said is speculation, but I do think some of the things I was just talking about would explain why it's performing so well and why some people were taken off guard. And it also explains why AMD thinks they can get away with $480. So, but let's talk about that now. Let's get to our final concluding thoughts. Should you buy this card? Should you try to buy this card? <laughs> and will you be able to buy this card? Well, I, I find something very interesting. I've come to the conclusion personally over the last few months that talking about availability is unfortunately a waste of time for most of the viewers. Uh, it doesn't matter if literal earnings reports prove that AMD sold more cards than previous launches. If people can't get a hold of their new toy, they just say it was a paper launch. And they get mad at, you know, people who review graphics cards. They'll get mad at people like me and they get mad at AMD. So talking about availability is kind of a net loss. I wouldn't do that if I was AMD. I would just try to make as many cards as I can and stay quiet about that because it's only going to make people mad when they don't get a product, which I get. I get why people are mad about what's going on with availability and prices right now, to be clear. 
But AMD actually said in the presentation that availability will be better, or at least that's what they're telling some people, although some of that information's conflicting. And that's kind of what I've heard as well. I'm just not emphasizing it because I don't see the point on emphasizing something that just gets people mad at me. So I don't know. I guess what I'm saying is this. Either AMD is making a massive blunder by talking about there being more availability with this launch, or they're willing to talk about something with a lot of downside if you talk about it, because they really will. And so, yeah, I hope so, because oh, there's a lot of pessimism online about that right now, and AMD is making a major mistake if they don't really supply magnitudes more cards with this launch than previous launches, but... If I were them, I would be. If I were them, I would be switching a lot of what was going to be big Navi capacity to little Navi, considering how well these things perform in 1440p. And so was I impressed by this presentation? I, I, you know, I, I wasn't sure how to feel about it. I actually put a poll in the Moore's Law is Dead Patreon, and the overall reaction was that the way I would summarize it is it seems like most people were expecting to not be impressed, but they were... I don't think quite pleasantly surprised, but somewhat satisfied with the level of performance for the price, assuming it can actually hit that price. And when I look at the poll, I would say I'm somewhere actually in the middle of the second and third option. I would say I'm mostly okay-ish on it, leaning towards slightly pleasantly surprised, but that I can't say I'm pleasantly surprised until I see if AMD actually manages to hold any cards near MSRP. And so the last thing I will say about the SEP or whatever of the 6700 XT is that, look guys, the 3060 is not a $330 card. The 3060 doesn't even have a Founders Edition at, a, at that bullshit price. It is a $500 card. And so you could almost argue that AMD putting the MSRP closer to what the street price will be is just being more honest. But that's only true if it does stay around $500 or $550 or whatever, right? If the 6700 XT climbs to $700, i am just going to be forced to go, yeah, not interested in this one really either. If I thought a 6800 XT wasn't worth $1,000, I don't think this is worth $700. But if the highly overclocked models that maybe beat the 3070 and 1440p on average... Cost less than the 3070 while giving you more RAM. That is a better product. And if the standard models match the 3070 with more RAM around 500, that is a better option than what you're seeing the 3060 sell for right now. So I'm forced to conclude that in the short term, I would really try to get one of those reference models from AMD's website. And if the review day benchmarks, which we do, Maybe, I guess, it's all about getting it first, I guess, but I would like to say you should wait for a review day benchmarks. If they do show the performance is what AMD's claiming it will be, then yeah, I, it's the best thing you can get for around 500 but that will only remain true if they actually can keep the street price there with more availability, which they're claiming it will have. And I guess that's all there really is left to say in this video. It looks like it is, unlike the 3060, an actually good card, stronger than its predecessor while keeping a small die size. And that if they can fill the channel, if they do decide to just make two of these instead of one 6800 and supply them around $500, I do think it can help the market. Um, yeah, uh, it's funny how coming out of a new graphics card presentation with lukewarm feelings almost feels like good feelings because i expect everything to be horrible in this market lately and so i just hope that it can at least stay there because having something that's okay is a lot better than what we've been getting recently and well yeah i will cover all of that in my upcoming videos and podcasts so make sure you subscribe to the channel and ring the bell button subscribe to broken silicon on your preferred podcast app and remember if you do want to get that podcast early and ad free and exclusive podcasts and pieces of content weekly and the ability to ask us questions access to the discord and so many other things we're giving our patrons right now please check out the moore's laws dead Patreon, it is what makes this possible, helps me, helps our audio engineer, helps Dan, co-host of Broken Silicon. We really do need your support. And as always, thank you for watching.